Hi, welcome to Head Start, the podcast for race directors and the business of putting on races. Racing has come a long way since the days when women were being told that running the marathon would cause your uterus to fall out. And with women now making up 54% of all race registrations in the US, according to Run Signups 2022 Race Trends Report, you'd think there'd be very little holding women back from racing in this third decade of the 21st century. That, however, is not the reality for most women out there. According to today's guest, she races founder and GB Team Ultra runner Sophie Power. Whether it's images of uniformly male start lines, lack of reasonable pregnancy deferral policies, or unnecessarily aggressive race cutoff times, races still, knowingly or unknowingly, put up more visible and invisible barriers for female athletes than they should or realize. And that means fewer women at start lines, fewer women signing up for races, and fewer women thinking they belong in the world of endurance sports racing. So what are those barriers holding women back and what can race directors do to remove them? Well, the good news is we have a fairly good grasp of the former and some very easy fixes for the latter that in many cases require only a little thoughtfulness and little to no extra cost. Things like providing basic sanitary products for female athletes at toilet facilities and aid stations or trying harder to give female competitions the attention they deserve and female race finishers the properly fitting finisher shirt they have paid for. Simple things, in other words, that when implemented and communicated right can make female athletes feel more comfortable and more welcome in races. So if you're one of those race directors who may not have thought so far about this aspect of your event or may have already considered it and need some practical advice for getting there, stick around for an episode full of insights and practical tips for making your event a little female friendlier. Before we get into this amazing episode, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our amazing podcast sponsor, Run Sign Up, race director's favorite all-in-one technology solution for endurance and fundraising events. More than 28,000 in-person, virtual and hybrid events use Run Sign Up's free and integrated solution to save time, grow their events and raise more. And we'll be hearing a bit more from this great company a little later in the podcast. But now, let's dive into our discussion on supporting female athletes with She Races founder, Sophie Power. Sophie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you on the podcast. It's a discussion I've been uh, really meaning to have. Where are you joining from today? So I am based in Guildford in the North Downs, which is about 30 miles from south of London and can the first kind of decent piece of countryside outside the city. So it's, um, it's beautiful here. So for, I guess, you know, US-based folks, you're one of the many satellite towns around London, right? Is that, is that a fair description? Pretty much. I mean, we're, 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 we're half an hour on the train, so everyone commutes in, but we live here because it's, it's rolling hills and forests and, um, and runners live here because the trails are awesome. And did I, did I um, hear on the news you guys are having a, like a heat wave or something? Just recently, hottest day of the year or something I, I, I saw on the news somewhere? It's, it's not too bad. I think we think of heat, we have quite temperate climate here because we're so close to sea. It's only, it's only an hour's drive to the sea. So compared to what's been happening in, in the U.S., I think we've been very, very lucky. But it has been. And I've got the, the World Championships in Taiwan in December. Um, for 24 hour running, which can be really hot. So actually some of the recent weather has been really good for heat training and working out kind of the kit and nutrition. So I, I shouldn't really complain as a runner. It's been a very uh, weird summer, actually. I mean, living in Europe, it's been a very, very weird summer um, all around, around the globe, really crazy stuff happening. So you are the founder of uh, She Races, which I came across, I think, a year or so back, which is the time at which I, I, I started trying to contact you. It, it, took, it took a while <laughs> to get us here. So do you want to tell uh, our listeners a little bit about uh, She Races and the mission behind it and how the whole thing came about? I rewind about five years, I guess, when I was photographed breastfeeding my three-month-old baby uh, whilst running UTMB, which is a 106-mile trail around the Alps. Um, and the reason I was there was because I had been denied a deferral uh, by the race director. And actually, I'd lost another place four years earlier um, when pregnant with my first son. And I knew I'd, I'd, I didn't want to lose my opportunity again. It'd taken four years to get there. Um, so I thought, I'll just try and get to 10K, get halfway around the course. Um, and I managed to finish with my 
three month old baby kind of expressing feeding and it re- made me realize it the photo went viral around the world and it made me realize that there's a massive barrier to, to women in racing and first and all these race directors contacted me and said we just didn't think about pregnancy we didn't think that all these women were losing their places and we weren't supporting them back so I started kind of working with some of the races on pregnancy policies and I managed to drive change at, at London Marathon um and and then Berlin followed and working most recently with Chicago I'm now UTMB but it came to me that it, it, the barriers are more than just about um pregnancy you know, women face kind of barriers that are different to men in all aspects and they're stopping us getting to the start line and people say well kind of you know there's more women runners and men runners why do you need to race but you know we all know racing special you know that feeling of being together that feeling of training for something that crossing the finish line and so I set out to really understand what these barriers were so I did a big piece of research um over 2,000 women um from 5k runners to ultra marathon runners um running on average kind of four races a year um a good spread back of the pack front of the pack kind of diverse age range kind of um not enough diversity of color um but we since then had kind of reach out to those organizations to to really understand more and it was really clear what these barriers were and so many of them can be addressed by races we can't address the the, the society barriers um kind of the, the, the fact we have babies in the first place the fact that we take on the caring responsibilities but there are so many simple things races can do. Um, so working with an awful lot of race directors um, on, you know, what can be done really easily, what is free, what is so simple to do that it's just a no brainer. Um, I created a set of guidelines, put them on the website. And that's really what she races is. We, we give these race guidelines to directors. We support them making their races more inclusive for women. Um, and we do campaign for change, um, especially with the bigger organisations where it needs to done, where those organisations such as UTMB, such as London Marathon, are really setting the standards for, for other organisations within the sport. Um, and now I also sit on the board of the ITRA, the International Trail Running Organiz- um, Association, and starting to work through the guidelines through the trail races. So it's everything from 5K upwards. It's triathlon, it's swimming. It's such a commonality. Um, but it's so important that when races kind of put the guidelines in place, you get more women on the start line. And I know that's great for business too. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, that's a great point to end, to end on. I know many people try to wrap their heads around um, inclusivity and like, you know, encouraging women and minorities and all of that. And, and I did for a while as well, until the whole thing about needing all of these people for good business, to be honest, just struck me, right? I mean, it's whatever you may think of, you know, like the moral issues or whatever involved in this, as an industry, we need to get... We need to just broaden the appeal of racing to to all kinds of people. I mean, w- we need them, given how how the industry is plateauing. And that's, I think that's that's a great point. I mean, we know that kind of race signups are down. Is it easier to get more of the eighty percent that you have in your start line, or look at the twenty percent, thirty percent? Kind of, if you can make some small changes to attract them. But I think industry wise, brands are waking up to this as well. And, you know, we have a lot of races where I look at some of the change we've managed to to drive in some big races that initially said no. Um, the brands have said, well, if we're going to continue to sponsor you, you need to be inclusive of women. You can't discriminate against women. You can't give them T-shirts that don't fit and the men get a better price. You can't cover the, the men's race more than the women's race. You can't do that. And we're not going to be involved as a brand. So I think kind of for races getting in front of this, and able to attract more brands uh, because of it, because you're seeing these amazing kind of diverse uh, photography from the races and the great feedback of people involved. And I think it's also kind of, we talk about women, but a lot of the, the barriers are there for men too. Like a lot of men don't feel that they belong. There's a lot of men that are at the back of the pack. This is not just about women, but we know that when the changes are made, you know, they affect ever on the race and you just get a better event as a result. Yeah, absolutely. Another great point we'll be uh, we'll be exploring when we go in in detail through the the guidelines that you guys have um, have issued. Before we move on from you 
There's two other things I want to dwell on uh, briefly because I just think they're super interesting. One is your athletic credentials because, uh, you know, you also run for Great Britain and also what you've been doing before she races and all that. I mean, you know, you were... You were at Oxford doing PP and stuff, which <laughs> you checked out my CV. <laughs> yeah, I hear it's it, it's the staircase to um to Westminster, and and here you are. So, where did it all go wrong? <laughs> I like to think I'm adding more value to society than most of my peers. Um, that's quite funny. It's 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 a it's a lot. So I um running wise, um I was second last in the mile at school. I was I was overweight. I think I identify with a lot of the women I speak to of not really feeling I belonged in sport. Um, and now I sort of a trustee of women in sport who's all about getting women and girls kind of into sport and, and being recognised and being empowered to do so, which is kind of quite a big change using that background. But um, yeah, I started running by accident. Um, I was doing I'd lost my job in finance. So I went from PPE to um, private equity and investment banking and became a global CFO and then then see before I kind of that photo was taken our CEO of a tech company so that's my background but I when I started running was um in 2010 and I um accidentally signed up for the marathon de sub which is the 250k desert race accidentally did you say yeah <laughs> because I've been I'd lost my job I've been made redundant in a really awful way and I just didn't know where to go and I've been doing some kickboxing to take my stress out and a friend had done it and um, when I was at university I actually trained in the air force as a, a navigator and pilot um, alongside my studies and we'd done this long march called the Nijmegen march which is um, 100 miles over four days um, and one of my friends did the marathon de Saab and he goes you could do this everyone walks they say it's the toughest baddest race on earth that everyone's going to die in but, you know, 90 plus percent of people finish and you just have to walk, um, which is actually I draw on that a lot when I think about language that races use because everyone walks. Um, and so I trained from having never run a mile in my life to Marathon de Saab in nine months and realized you know, I was a pretty good endurance athlete. Um, and since then, I did the stage races all around the world as my holiday every year from kind of Bhutan to Cambodia to Iceland to um, Utah, the Grand to Grand. Um, in the US and then I had my kids realized I couldn't go away for weeks on end and um but I'll just run the whole distance at once so now I love the 100 mile distance um longer than that but yeah I became a when I was 40 and I'd had three babies um I qualified for the great British um 24 hour running team so I ran 235.7 kilometers in 24 hours a few weeks ago and I'm off to the World Championships in December. So yeah, it's 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 a big change from being the one kind of second last in the mile. Um, and it's a big kind of, I won't call it a career change, I call it a career break, I think kind of, I'm not paid for any of this. This is what I do as a passion project, but it's so important. And yeah, back to PP, I do feel I'm probably adding more value than um, some of the people that went into Westminster. I'm sure there's many listeners who would agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's remarkable because I usually... I mean, anecdotally, what I tend to um, see is that people who do very well in endurance sports later in life generally tend to be sporty since uh, from a very young age. And it's and it's interesting that you mentioned that 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 was in your profile, which is which is quite interesting. I think and we see that. And so one of the things women in sport find is that, you know, most of the women in executive positions in the UK, there aren't enough of us, but most of them played sport as a child and team sport because or they're running or they have that that kind of sense of athleticism and it teaches you so much and then you hold that through life um but what i'm seeing is a lot of women that weren't sporty at school um but then you realize that in your day-to-day life you earn kind of you have the the part of especially ultras you have the part that was you as an athlete and then actually often the bigger part is you as a person and how you handle the logistics and hand yourself and pace and feed yourself and I mean, mothers are brilliant at this. I mean, I look after five people on a daily basis and on an ultra, I just have to look after myself. It's easy. Um, whereas I see some guys just forget to feed themselves for hours and they do do their feet and they don't really go out too fast. And so there's definitely some some upside from, from being a woman. But um, 
yeah, there's a, there's a lot of us finding kind of a, a second wind and, and it's brilliant. And the more we can, the more races can appeal to those women and start them off at the 5K. And then you can hear these women that started the 5K or the Couch to 5K app we have in the UK. And then a few years later, you see them doing an ultra or a triathlon and it's amazing. Yeah. Chrissy Wellington, which is one of my um, all-time favorite athletes, who's a triathlete, used to like win Ironman contest all over the place she had a very similar actually trajectory to you she was just i think she was working at like some kind of civil service yeah. job or something yeah, and then one day in her 30s she wakes up and then she just goes out and crushes it which is i mean she's <laughs> unusual it's, uh, that's that's gifted people for you she's absolutely phenomenal oh yeah she's borrowed a bike and some shoes and goes up winning a triathlon and then goes from that it's, it's phenomenal but i think because we don't have so much access to, to sport as as we, and and U.S. is far better than this because you have the equal scholarships that we do not have um, in the U.K. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of women out there that haven't run before, that haven't done sport, that are a whole kind of untapped market um, for races and especially kind of benefit from, from them kind of giving us that strength through the rest of our lives. Let's get into the subject of women athletes and races. And I want to start off with sort of, just taking a view of where we are today, um, hopefully we've come some way from, you know, over the last few years, and we're going to get into how, how most races can can do even better than that. But I'm just curious, now that you mentioned also the, you know, that, that famous photo of yours at UTMB breastfeeding that sort of, you know, went viral. That was 2017, was it? 2018. 2018. Okay. So you sitting there, and you look pretty knackered, by the way, uh, breastfeeding your toddler and then your baby, I should say. And then, the, you know, like bunch of hundred mile running men and women, I guess, around you. Like, do you remember at all how you were viewed, you know, like just sitting there at the aid sta- station breastfeeding? Like what, what was, it must have been fairly strange, like, like a strange scene for people back then. I mean, no one noticed me. And that, and that, apart from the photographer, and this is the, when you're at the 50 mile point of a hundred mile race or 56, whatever, call my errors, um, you're so wrapped up in your own, own world, you don't see anyone else. Um, and so no one really noticed. And I was at the side kind of getting on with it. I mean, my baby, yeah, Cormac was only three months and so he's exclusively breastfed and we had to kind of that was the only way I was going to get around the course and pumping and expressing and kind of squeezing out behind trees just to relieve all the pain. And um, that there was just nothing unusual. I think someone came up to me at the finish when I was feeding him again and going, I'm a midwife and this is really cool. Um, but no, no one noticed. And it was only when the photo, Alexis Berg, this, he's a, one of the best trail photographers in the world, um, happened to see it. And I actually met him in Chamonix a couple of weeks ago just to actually talk about what happened. Um, and we put it out there and it just, it just spoke to so many people on so many levels and, and the race organizer side of what they could do more was such a tiny part of it. And there was the breastfeeding public and women not feeling comfortable to do that. And there was just the the difficulty of getting back to who you are after you have a baby and setting your goals and going after your goals and society telling you that, you know, that's unacceptable as a mother. You know, you just need to be only focused on your baby. And but we know that, you know, you're a, when you're an athlete, you're actually a, a healthier mum. When you when you train through pregnancy, your baby comes out fitter. Uh, we should be encouraging this, but society doesn't yet. And the research is catching up, but it takes a long time. So um, that's that's a yeah, no one noticed. Um, and I, I asked the visit deferral, didn't get the deferral. I thought I'm just going to be on the start line because I'm going to lose my place otherwise. Well, one of the reasons I ask that is because, and I totally get the whole, you know, like on a 50 mile aid station, everyone's in sort of like doing their own thing. But my question was mostly because what I, what I realized from these kinds of discussions is how difficult it is for me, at least I won't speak of all men necessarily to basic, to connect with the experience of women during races and to connect with, I guess, the grievances and the and the sort of internalized complaint complaints women may have during races and and you mentioned that you know during the setup of uh, she races you had a chance to speak to a lot of women i'm just wondering 
what does it feel to be like a woman showing up at a race and feeling a little bit kind of like out of place, you know, like the kinds of things that someone like me showing up at, you know, at a marathon or something won't, won't even notice. Like how, how does that feel from a woman's point of view? I mean, a lot of us don't show up in the first place. A woman, uh, if you look at kind of some of the race websites, you don't feel you belong uh, from the imagery and you get there and you're in the real minority. And, you know, I'm a fairly silly, still young, white, athletic female. And I often don't feel I belong when I'm surrounded by men. And YouTube start is uh, until this year, it was under 10 percent women. Um, so it's very intimidating um, to not feel that you belong um, and to not have the confidence to be there. And the language you have often kind of when men realize there aren't many women, they're like, oh, you're good to be here. Oh, oh, it's, it's amazing kind of that you're here and you feel that you belong even less um, on that start line. And. I understand and I loved learning from so many different women and learning about their experiences. Um, and I guess the the insight work we did had a lot of free flow forms. So women could just write stories about it. And I had a lot of men saying, there's no barriers to my race race. There's no barriers to my race. Anyone can sign up for my race. There are no barriers. Um, I'm giving everyone an equal experience. Uh, I'm, 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 I've, 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 I've given the women equal prize money. It's an equal race. And when you tell some of the stories of what happens and how women feel, they're like, it's not equal at all. Um, women are not having the same experience. We're cut off from signing up in the first place. And our competitive race is undervalued. Um, and I think when you tell the stories to race directors, they're like, ah, oh, I get it. And actually, this is so easy to fix. And I'm just going to fix it because not only it's the right thing to do, but also, you know, my race is a business. Yeah, we're, we're going to go through um, a couple of those kind of like blind spots that turn into kind of like light bulb moments. Because as you say, um, and it's something I was discussing with Amy Charity, um, a, f um, a female race director I had on doing um, the uh, Steamboat Gravel Race in the in the US, very, very prestigious, very large race, um, that it's it's really, as you say, things that can very easily be fixed. And hopefully by the end of this episode, people are going to have lots of tools in their, in their toolkit to, to go out and make their races a little bit friendlier for women. One, one thing I want to ask is, and you sort of touched on this before yourself, obviously UTMB, ultra running, trail running, um, definitely sort of behind the curve industry-wise in female participation. But I was just looking at the um, the Run Signups Race Trends report from last year just to remind myself of the numbers. And in the US, at least, um, a, a very large percentage of um, runners are women. And actually, in some discipline, like road running, lower, you know, sort of like shorter distances in road running, in many races, they might they may even be the majority. So when you're thinking of she races mission and the things you want to be doing and the problem. Oh, like the issues in the industry. Are you including those races? Or do you think we can go further even in races where participation is sort of almost 50-50 or better for women? Do you think there's improvements to be made there as well? Oh, absolutely there is. And I know that women are the majority in 5K and in a lot of the 10Ks. And when you go the longer races um, where the barriers are often kind of more obvious, you know, a lot of ultras are kind of below 20%. Um, UTMB is only this the first time I think above 10% in the longer race um, but I still think there are things that can be done and if you look at the think about running as a progression journey people often start at the 5k and let's get more women into those 5ks if we give them a great experience they might have signed up if we give them a great experience and give them so much confidence at that race then they're going to look at that 10k and then they may push up to the marathon or they may run more and more 5ks so I think it's a if we think about real inclusivity, we want a woman to feel comfortable on a start line, have a great experience, no matter what the race distance. But there are more obvious barriers um, for the longer races. And we think about things like safety um, and going into remote areas. And we think kind of about kind of period products. And we think about what we need as women and um, places where harassment may occur. It's the longer races, but absolutely for the 5Ks. You know, there's an there's an elite competition in 5K and the women's race is often kind of an afterthought to the men's and you can't filter the results out. So how do women how do women feel that that we're equally valued as athletes if we can't see our competitive race? 
So in terms of, I guess, representation, where do you think should the end point be? Are, are we sort of like trying to, to, to make the percentage of women in races equal to the percentage of men who, let's say, take up ultra running as a hobby kind of thing? Like, is, is that where we're sort of where we want to be? I don't think there should be a target because I think there'll be certain races that kind of may appeal more to kind of women, may appeal more to men. I would say that a lot of people say, you know, women don't want to run the longer races. And I'd argue very strongly that women do want to do hard things and we're very capable. And if you look at the races that have kind of put in place kind of policies that are female friendly um, and some of the kind of she races, ones that we kind of accredit, um, they're, they're 50% women. I mean, the Lakeland 50 miler in the UK is gnarly. It's a really tough fell running course. It's hard. It's got 50% women. We have that with the 100Ks, um, kind of the race, the stones type races, 50% women. If you put the, if you make races uh, kind of uh, attractive to women, we will want to race them. So I think kind of aiming for certain percentages is the wrong thing to do, removing the barriers and making them attractive and making sure that there's nothing that a race can change that is um, a race is doing that's off-putting in some way. I think that should be the focus because if we start focusing on percentages, I, I think the, the ballot races that are very tight in the ballot that can adjust the percentage that way, um, it's a great way to start doing that just so we see more of us there and then more of us going about the next year. Um, but no, we, we just want women to have that equal opportunity to be in those start lines. And in terms of your discussions with race directors, where do you think the the typical mentality of, of race directors you, you get to speak with about these kinds of issues is right now? So like, how how aware are race directors of the barriers that, you know, you share with them later? I think they're not aware. And I think the the conversation, I think we have, I have a lot of messages on, from race directors go, I just read your guidelines. I thought I was doing everything I could. I didn't understand why there weren't women on the start line. And now I understand why there weren't women on the start line. And it could even be um, that kind of they actually are doing everything and it is a great race experience, but they're not telling you anything about it on the website when you sign up. And they've put their, their main image as the start line, which is generally skinny white men and no woman knows that there are great toilet provisions. No one knows that there's kind of a, a female fit t-shirt or an option not to. No one can see any evidence that they're valuing that the female winners. So that's why. So I think there's a, a light bulb moment for a lot of race directors when they read it. And a lot of thinking, how how did I have such a blind spot um, before? And we know a lot of race directors are men. We know that kind of they're designing the race, of course, through their own lens. Um, we're just giving a support to say, think about these things. And when they do, the changes that happen are, are very quick because kind of we have race directors go, I can change my website today and I can do this today. And kind of, well, I guess we'll get on to what it means to she races race, but we, we just make race directors commit to basic principles of kind of quality and kind of no harassment, the obviously the, the equal prize money and the, the equal coverage, um, but also communicating it on the website that you do believe in a fair race and you do um, want women there. And that alone is, is huge for women. So let's get through those um, guidelines um, sort of in, in greater detail. This is, this is um, by the way, a document that is available on sheraces.com um, under... Uh, race, race guidelines. Race guidelines. Um, it's also a document that we've put up on our site under the document section. There's a link. Actually, we don't have the actual document, but it links back to the same thing in case it gets updated. So people can download it there as well. Um, and it's basically like a couple of pages long. And, you know, as you say, it's sort of like looking at all those barriers that races inadvertently put up that hold uh, women back or, or make them feel, you know, a little bit less welcome. So let's, let's look at some of those. The first one, which I think is a, is a, is a very common complaint from uh, minority groups as well as an, a, and others, is making the start line more inclusive. The imagery that you were mentioning there, you know, like just seeing basically, you know, like just, just 
white men there, right? And and we've been through that before. But just again, in your own words, why why is this so important for for someone who's looking to join the race and doesn't see themselves on that start line? And then we don't sign up. I mean, that that's a lot of women, and you may have men that this this doesn't matter so much to you, but kind of I spoke to a lot of women of color about this, and especially for them, um, and plus size women as well. Um, you know, they're in they're in the race. Mm-hmm. And and if you look at the finishes, there there there's people there, but they're not in that imagery. And if we don't see it, we think it's kind of an elite men's race, and that we're going to be last, and we're going to get cut off really soon. And um and I've seen races that I feel uncomfortable, and I shouldn't be. That there's no reason for me to feel uncomfortable. Um, but we can, from the 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 research we do, you know, one in one in five women have directly not signed up for a race because of the imagery. And kind of half of women think it's a real issue and sign up for race and they want that better imagery. And part of it is is the start line. And, you know, kind of if you're going to reserve a part of your start line for women, at least we see the women. And so competitive women can see there are other competitive women there. So a lot of races will split their start line and have a little um, line down. So just the, fact, the women who want to really kind of go for the win have that space for themselves and they're not pushed back in the pen. Um, but making sure that there's a, a, a really great carousel um, of all types of women and all types of men too. This is not just about women um, and on the social media um, and that some of those stories are shared um, of those women that are running their first race or kind of have come to it later in life or running with their friends or have a great story. Something that makes us feel there's someone like us running the race. And when I get there, I'm not going to feel in the minority. Just playing devil's advocate for a minute, do you think using that kind of imagery may then dissuade a certain type of man from taking part in that race? Would would they would they look at that image and think, ah, you know, this is this is not the race for me? Like and, and they'll and they'll go on and look for something tougher or with that kind of image of, you know, like the all elite looking men at the start line kind of thing? We've never heard that feedback and we've never seen races that do put up kind of great imagery then have a, a, a suffer a fallout at the 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 competitive level it's probably something to look at i i very much so we've never seen that from race directors and i think if it was happening um because some race directors have made big changes then we'd be aware of it but if we think the super elite men is a, is a very small minority of the field and maybe you, you take a hit of a few runners there but you're getting hundreds of runners at the other side um and there are race directors that want their races to be an elite only race and um, they're not very interested in having women on the start line. And they're an absolutely tiny minority. And, you know, I think at some point brands are going to realise that they should be sponsoring these races um, and they'll, they'll die out. Because closely tied to this representative start line point is the other point you have on the guidelines about language, which, again, many times, and I've seen it a lot having organized an ultra myself and been in that community for a while as a spectator, I should say. The whole kind of like, you know, toughest race this, toughest race that, whatever, like it sells a lot with a certain, you know, with a certain crowd. So, but you're saying that using that kind of language, and actually that's, that, that makes quite a lot of sense to me, actually. It puts a lot of people off, right? I mean, you can advertise a race as the toughest race, this and that, and then expect you know, like a beginner ultra runner or, or even like a beginner marathoner, right? If you do it for a marathon or something, for whatever kind of race, you can, you can have it both ways. If you, if you position it as, you know, and you advertise it as the toughest this and that, you are going to put some people off. Oh, and a lot of people off. I mean, I think in our, in our research, you know, 46% of women haven't signed up for a race because of the, of the language. And, kind of the, and, and, and they assume that this is, I think, it's linked to kind of cutoffs. They, they think they won't make it because they they can't do the toughest baddest race. And I think this is, it is really important to, if a race is tough, to make that very clear. Um, and we've got races in the UK that I am not technically qualified to run the sky running. Um, I'll fall off a cliff somewhere. Um, and you've got to make that clear. But being, you can have kind of, this is a, a tough race. And I think people want to feel they're doing a tough race, but not a dangerous race. And I think this is where you come to the language involved going, you know, this is a 50 mile race. We have a 15 hour cutoff. This is how fast you need to go to meet that cutoff 
it's very tough. It's a long way. But this is what you need to be able to do. And then kind of as a woman, and I, I guess a lot of men going, well, I know I can cover this ground in this. I know I can walk this speed. If I break that down, yes, I think there's a good chance that I can finish that. So enabling people to believe that it, it's not taking away from the toughness. 50 miles is tough. Um, so marathons are tough. Um, but making them realize I can do this because I I've got these concrete steps that I need to take and I need to get to this point by this time and I can practice it and my training. Um, and in the same way, not putting training plans up that say you need to run 70 miles a week to finish a 30 mile race, which I've seen before, um, which is crazy. And it puts so many people off because they can do it and they could actually walk it tomorrow. But we're putting these people off and even women that would be way in front of the cutoffs, just giving that seed of doubt because you're saying it's dangerous and tough maybe it's not for me yeah i think i think the whole training plan i'm sure you'll agree is generally meant in a nice kind of way right i mean people put up training plans generally as a courtesy to participants and basically to help them out but i do agree that you know if the training plan has a has a running load of like you know 200 hours a week or something yeah it's going to it's going to freak some people off for sure um cutoffs which you mentioned is a very important part of this, actually. Uh, and it's another thing that I was discussing with Amy back in the in the Steamboat Gravel episode. Some races just choose to be very aggressive with cutoffs, and some races choose to be more relaxed about it. And honestly, I can't really make out why a race would want to have very, very tight cutoffs, other than bragging rights, or maybe, or maybe just not realizing that their cutoffs are too tight, right? I mean, from your point of view, also having race stuff, is there any reason why you wouldn't extend cutoffs by an hour or two just to accommodate more people? I think, I mean, from a race director standpoint, there are often logistical reasons. So if you've got road closures, if you've got kind of crew out there for a long time, and the question is, how long do you go? And um I think we have to think about what race directors can do, what's going to be within budget. Um, they've got volunteers out in the courses as well. That said, um, the, there are very few races that need to have the tight cutoffs they do. I think there's one race in the UK that had a, a 10K cutoff of an hour and 10 minutes. Um, most women can't run a 10K in an hour and 10 minutes. And the ones that can will be so scared of missing the cutoff that they won't apply anyway. Um and I'm thinking of it's not just about the cutoffs, it's about the mid cutoffs as well. So some race directors have a very aggressive first cutoff that you have to run or go all out. And they don't allow for even pacing. So kind of cutoffs should assume an even pace, which um, maybe kind of women are kind of the, those at the back of the pack are more likely to be keeping to than runners who sprint off and then run out of steam, as sometimes I do. And I think it's kind of thinking creatively if it's a restriction. So we had a fell race in the UK and they had a very tight cutoff um, for the race because of volunteer safety uh, on the mountain. They didn't want the volunteers up the fell. Um, so we would think quite creatively, but well, actually, why don't we have a start time that's an hour earlier for people? You don't have to open the first checkpoint any earlier because they'll, the faster runners would have made up that hour by the first checkpoint. And that just opens up the race to so many people. And then they realize with the the next year, they had double the women over 50 years old um, registering, many more men over 60 years old registering because of this kind of new inclusivity going. And it cost the race directors nothing. It cost no more volunteer time. People were already, the race sign up was already open. So they weren't opening the, the, the kind of registration any longer. And it made a huge difference. So I think it's understanding where the cutoffs are, explaining them, explaining them to people, you know, this is what you have to do, and trying to enabling people to finish that race. Um, and then at the back of the race, where the cutoffs are, you know, not closing down the race right at the cutoff. So if you allow people to be in your race, giving them that same experience as the people at the front, so you know they'll come back again next year. Yeah, it's amazing to to be able to see the impact of these very subtle tweaks to things like that in actual part participation numbers. I, I mean, it sort of like makes the case quite clearly for uh, for, for making this, these little tweaks. And as, as we keep saying, another thing to remember is, you know, 
obviously we're we're looking at at women today specifically but lots of these things are barriers to slower men right they're they're barriers to so many people uh, lots of men would be intimidated by exactly the same kinds of things that are putting women off well, that we're discussing today so it's a it's a much broader thing now on cutoffs one thing you mentioned to me the other day that I, I I actually went back to the guidelines and I don't think it's there, which I think is a brilliant idea. Quoting cutoffs in pace terms. I think that's like a much more natural way of quoting cutoffs, right? I mean, because everyone at the end of the day, what does a cutoff mean, right? It, it's an arbitrary amount of time. Everyone does the back calculation in their in their minds. So I think that's a, definitely a very helpful thing to at least have the pace next to the cutoff time. It just helps a lot of people understand what we're talking about. I need to update the guidelines, don't I? There's a few bits to add. I love adding bits and pieces all the way. We always get feedback and, and I love I love hearing things that aren't in there. And, and, and definitely can anyone listening, like if you have ideas to make them better, please let us know. We just add everything in because we have blind spots too. Um, we haven't talked to every single woman, every single race director, but it really is. And if you look at some of the paces needed, I mean, you can walk and I always joke kind of when I got around UTMB with breastfeeding, my pelvis wasn't actually back together yet properly. And I'd only you know, take a running steps, very few running steps um, before I set out for 106 miles. And I hiked. I hiked almost the whole race. I had to jog at the first bit to make the first cutoff. But then I hiked and I was, I think, in the top half of, 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 kind of starters um, finishing. I had three hours before the cutoffs. Um, I hiked. Um, a lot of ultras aren't running races. A lot of 5K, 5K races, you can walk. Um, and I think kind of starting to say that they're running races, but it's movement of body races in a way. And just people going, I can do that. Whatever you can say to people to say, I can do that. Um, you're going to have kind of the toilets you need. You're going to have all these food at the aid stations. This is how we're going to support you. Um, this is what we, and I think this is with the language as well. The cutoffs are there for a reason. And having this feeling that races want you to finish rather than we're going to take you out. Like if you are one second over leaving the aid station, we are going to take you out. Instead of saying, we're going to do everything we can to help you to finish. If we don't feel that you're in a great state leaving and it it'd be worrying, get you to the next checkpoint. That's when we'll withdraw you from the race. But I think flexibility, you miss it by five minutes, but you're moving well. Let them go through. Um, these kind of feelings, it's, it's just an atmosphere of a race that comes across in the language that's on the website. You know whether they, they really care about you. And we have these lovely races in the UK called X Energy Races, and they're about 33 miles on trail. And then you stay over in a school sports hall in your sleeping bags, and then you run back the next day. But they don't have a cutoff. If you're moving, you keep going and then everyone's had their dinner and you're cheering the last finishes in and it's just beautiful. And and those people then have a realise how fast they can go. And then they'll have the confidence to sign up for something that's maybe a bit tighter. Well, my impression in some of this is um, that I see in many other places is that the industry is slowly shifting from looking at what we do races as as more focused on the competitive aspect of it. And the more popular it becomes and more it opens up, shifting more towards the experience side of things. And obviously races are always going to be races, it's going to be first and last and times and all of that stuff. But, you know, as you say, shifting from a mentality of, you know, the cutoffs are here sort of like to cut you out and basically, you know, drop you out of the race it would be more helpful to look at to look at the whole point of providing a race as an event director that we want you to finish and we want you to experience the race and okay we need to have cutoffs for you know as you say logistical reasons and you know we need to to give the roads back to traffic and stuff like that but it needs to come from a point of view of wanting participants to finish and wanting them to have a nice time and not necessarily have putting a race on, which I know some races are and, you know, they have their own audience or just being like a torture, right? Just for the, just for, for the, for the, for the point of it. Yeah, it's, it's bad. It's bad enough running some of the races. You don't want them to make it any harder than it needs to be. And I, I think that there's a culture around it and you can, you can make a lot of that come through in, in, in the communications of, you know, we care about you. This is about being together. It doesn't take anything away from the front end. Um, I mean, that I love 
having in a friendly race, but I'm going to race and I want to do well. But I still want to go to those races where I feel comfortable being. And I want to be around kind of other women and I want to kind of cheer everyone on. And I love kind of some of the bits where you have loop courses or, and that's, I get one thing that really attracts women is timed events. So it's a huge participation in timed events because you're often on a loop and you see so many more people. You also can't DNF. You cannot DNF a timed event if you step foot on that race course. So we also like that. It takes away the pressure of, I didn't finish the race. Um, but just being around that environment, I love. I mean, I run 24 hours around athletics tracks for fun. Um, and I love it because I see everyone, um, not just the people that are around me at the same speed. And that's a lot of what, what we want as a race. We want to um, experience and, and then a great atmosphere afterwards where everyone mixes and chats about kind of the course and how they took the wrong turn and kind of whinge about the signage and kind of um, and how good and say how good the pizza van is. And it, it is. It, it's we choose, This isn't our job. Like, but unless you're the elite, this isn't our job. This is what we choose to do. Let's let's make it as fun as possible. So you've got a great thing going. You've built a great event that people love from the ground up and you're ready to take it to the next level. But is your technology up to it? If you've been hacking your way so far using different tools for different jobs, having a so-so website and spending hours moving data back and forth from your registration platform to your email marketing provider and so on, it's time you upgraded your tech before you look into upgrading your race. With Run Signups All-in-One Technology Solution, you'll get all the tools you need and more all in one place to help you build a solid foundation that will help support your race's growth for years to come. Free email marketing, an awesome free custom website, a fully customizable registration experience, and awesome fundraising and participant-to-participant -participant referral tools are just some of the things you'll be getting when you join Run Signups industry-leading platform. With that, you'll get the resources and support you need to get you through the next stages of your growth journey and an amazing suite of race day tools to help you deliver a world-class race day experience to your participants and fans. So, to learn more about Run Signups market-leading technology used by over 28,000 in-person, virtual and hybrid events and to book a free demo tailored to your needs, make sure to visit runsignup.com today. That's runsignup.com and see what Run Signups awesome race technology can do to take your event to the next level. Okay, now let's get back to the episode. Let's move on to toilets, which is something you mentioned earlier. Such a key aspect of the race experience and such a, you know, completely non-abstract thing as well. I mean, you know, like toilets is probably the most concrete thing about putting on a race. Uh, we know participants love it because, you know, you, you know, you mess up your toilets. All of your race reviews are going to be, you know, like there weren't enough. Like it, it's the number one thing that rubs people the wrong way. I, I totally get it as a, as a runner myself. And you have some points about what race directors can do around toilets and changing facilities to, to, to help make them a little bit friendlier for women. Can you take us through that? So, I mean, women love to complain about toilets in general. Um, but we do say kind of when we ask people, you know, is it impacting your race? You know, kind of almost 70 percent of women say, you know, the races haven't got the right toilets. And if you think about a start line, a lot of races, especially trail races, they have an open start line and the men can just go pee. And some women, myself included, because I've been doing this long enough, I'm quite happy going behind a bush and peeing especially first time runners or if you need to change a tampon um or you need to do more than that you want a toilet and it's not just women that want more toilets it's some men can especially with medical issues that have come and said you know we want cubicles on course so it's thinking about where women want them it's also being very clear beforehand where they're going to be if you've just had a baby and for many of us kind of with pelvic floor disasters we want to know how far they are in between because we're going to need the toilet and we've had races where there have been loads of public toilets on course but they weren't in the logistics so a woman would see that there aren't any toilets and just would not sign up for that race because they couldn't be um there and i guess we've been very clear on kind of you know you've got two you've got female toilets and then you have you can have unisex toilets um and making sure that everyone's kind of comfortable using a toilet but there are ones with sanitary um, products in because 
especially with long races, you don't know when your period's going to start. It could be a week early, week late. Um, when you're perimenopausal, you've got no idea when it's going to start. Um, it could be a few weeks apart, could be a few months apart. Um, and we can't put the burden of just carrying in case on every single woman. So having the the, the peer products available, having the disposal facilities available. Um, and these are things that I think sometimes are uncomfortable conversations for men to have. Um, so just go and ask female runners, what do you want? What best can we do? We try and share some of the best practice um, among race directors, kind of taping things to the inside of, of, of portaloo doors. Um, it says a lot about race when they think about women separately to men in this way. Um, that goes across you know, how women feel about the race in general. I think kind of stopping kind of the men jumping into our queue. We don't like that. We have to queue longer than men in all aspects of our life for toilets. They can queue a few seconds um, more than we can. And, and, and it's something that girls kind of, kind of giggle at when there's so few of us in a race. Um, I guess we, maybe we don't want more women in these races because then we might actually have to queue for the toilet. Um, but la- changing facilities is a big one. Um, and kind of having somewhere to change that's in private um makes us more comfortable especially if there's a, a drop back situation in ultra um and there's women that will say they just can't be in a race um for kind of personal reasons if they don't know they're going to have these safe spaces so it's really simple um it's nothing to add i think this is the one guideline where kind of race directors have said i've had an additional cost to my event for meeting the guidelines but i've been able to put a toilet at a really important important point that hasn't left women three hours without a toilet. And it's got such great feedback that I know I'm going to recoup that cost on more female entries next year. Definitely the um the jumping cues, which by the way happens in in real life toilets as well, not only races. Uh the you know like just just men going into female toilets whenever they they feel like you know whenever they can't wait basically um is an important issue. And the separate toilets I find because you know Sometimes you go into a unisex toilet and it's a bit of a mess. And and men generally tend to handle that kind of mess better than women for, for physiological reasons. Now, the sanitary products I want to return to because there's two points I want to ask here. First of all is how far has the adoption of race directors making available sanitary products come so far? Do, 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 do race directors actually do that? And secondly, are you getting any pushback on that, at speaking to race directors? Because I guess I could see perhaps a perspective on this that, you know, although I actually take your point about, you know, like a period can come at any point, but like I can also see a side of this from the race director's point of view saying, what else are we going to be on the hook for? You know, should I have like, be allergy medicine for the guy that gets stung, like on every aid station that for the guy that gets stung by a bee or something like, do, do I need to basically try and prepare for everything? Is everything going to be on me? I know. I think that's a good pushback, but we haven't heard it. Um, I'll be honest. I think it's, it's been a blind spot for a lot of directors. And in the last year since three races are founded, there's a huge shift in races in the UK providing period products. Because there's no reason not to, because they're very cheap and you can put them in the toilets, you can put them in the, but at a minimum in kind of the first aid kits on the station and have them available. Showing they're available is great on an aid station, having kind of a basket out there that they're just there. They're not expensive and they do make women feel seen. And I think, so it's not just about the period, it's about us feeling seen as, as, as athletes in the race. Um, men often want to know how to do it. Um, I think that's the kind of send someone else out to buy them if you have to. Um, but it's 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 material what happens. If your period comes in the race, we had a lady who was in the, the 100K, kind of UTMB, the CCC race, and she DNF'd because her period came and there was nothing. Uh, there was nothing for her. There was nothing from anywhere there. And she, she, she'd flown over to France. She trained all year for it and she DNF'd her race. Now, for the sake of one person in your race DNFing because of their period, and and what that does to, to them, but what it does to the race and, and the race credibility, spending 10, I think 10 pounds, ten dollars on on period products that don't expire, um, that can be reused, um, it's an absolute no-brainer. Um there's there's no reason why um a race wouldn't do it. Um and it does it does make it does take your the worry out of if you're racing kind of 
three days away from your period or it's it's late kind of is there going to be something there for me um it takes that there's enough stress for going to a start line um without worrying whether there'll be period products there if you need them i'll have to ask a very dumb question here like because you know when i go to the supermarket or something like the the sanitary products aisle is just endless like <laughs> Is there a way for race directors to provide sanitary products in a way that would help all women or most women without, you know, like having to come up with like 15 different versions of it or something like practically? So women tend to wear, to use one of two things when they're racing. Um, You either use a pad um, or you use a tampon. And when you're racing, it's much better to have the tampon with the applicator because this is, you're, you're, you, 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 you're not going to have the cleanest hands when you're racing and you can't really kind of get them as clean as you want them to. So a tampon and um, a pad and a, a place to wash your hands as well. If women are using kind of moon cups or things like that, that's enough. Um, kind of if people have other ideas, then please let us know. Um, but that's what we say, kind of a pack of tampons, a pack of pads, encourage a person to take a few more with them when they're going. Um, that's enough. It is a, it is a minefield. There's an awful lot out there. Um, but between those two, you're pretty much cover all bases. Now, the one thing that you mentioned in the guidelines that has been, it's something that I just haven't been able to wrap my head around, even though the same statistics come out year after year, is women tech shirts, women like finisher shirts, right? And um, I went back again to to run Signups Race Trends Report from last year. And the number is crazy like only three percent of races off in the u.s offer female specific uh shirt sizes right three percent and women are like across all races there are like 35 percent in some races they're up to 50 percent or more i sort of get the point that you know adding another dimension to the races that you have to the shirts rather that you have to order you have to deal with the uncertainty how many people are going to be there what sizes am i going to order then you add men versus women on that it's just an added layer of complexity but like it must be very annoying from from a from a you know female participants point of view to go home with a like a terrible buggy t-shirt most of most most race t-shirts are not really good to begin with to be honest these days but like to have to go home with something that doesn't fit and it's like a wearing like a sack of potatoes or something it must be pretty damn annoying I tried on some of my race t-shirts when I was 37 weeks pregnant and they fit beautifully. Like the smallest size available every time, 37 weeks pregnant. I mean, they actually were really handy. Um, my husband has a great wardrobe of all these uh, kind of quite tough ultra marathon races that he he's never run, but there was no option not to have the t-shirts. So I think the first kind of, we're very kind of much in aligned with the green runners and that there are tens of thousands of races, uh, race t-shirts that go to landfill every single year. So there has to be an option not to have a t-shirt. And we'd rather that races charge them as an add-on. So if someone definitely wants that t-shirt. Um, and there are other options, kind of donating to local charities or kind of um, Trees Not Tees, uh, where we plant a tree instead of having a, um, a t-shirt, we absolutely support because the environmental side of race t-shirts is horrendous. Um, but our argument is, is women should have the, the the equal experience in the race, which means a T-shirt. It doesn't mean a T-shirt. It means a T-shirt that fits. because And that's better for the race director, too, because if someone's going to take a T-shirt, it's advertising your race. You want them to actually wear that T-shirt and be able to be proud of their race and be able to talk about their race. And they're not going to do it if it's this baggy monstrosity. And there are women that prefer that fit. So if you're ordering the race's t-shirts before the race, then there's no wastage. Um, going for a higher quality option that will last and then giving kind of men and women the choice of different fits and and what we like to have as well as the sizing because um, UK and US sizing is very different to European sizing. Um, so where I, I go for an extra small in the UK, if I'm doing a European mountain race, I'm a medium. They're absolutely tiny. Um, so putting the sizing on that, just with the chest measurement, it's so easy. You've got it anyway from the manufacturer. Why would you not just put it on the website? And then we're comfortable that if we're going to order a T-shirt, we know it's going to fit us. And I think there's nothing so devastating at the end of a, 
a race when you're absolutely knackered and your t-shirt doesn't fit and you look at the guy and he's wearing his and, and you can't and I did this race called the spine in the summer which is um 268 miles up the Pennine Way and I got to the end and I was exhausted I'd had four nights with no sleep uh, or very little sleep and the t-shirt was huge it was down to my knees and I cried in front of the race director I said I didn't deserve this I just didn't and I I had no but I had you know when you have no filter you're so tired you have no filter on your words that was pretty much I was like why why I've paid hundreds and hundreds of pounds this race and you've just given me this and I felt so much of the enjoyment how great I felt about the race just wiped away in that one second that you actually don't care about me as a woman as a, as an athlete because I'm not a man and you'll only cater to men and that was such a such a miss on the race director as society and they could have fixed it so yes we're, we're definitely you know and I think in the UK the numbers are much more positive on races giving female fit t-shirts because we've campaigned for it and women I think one of the big things about she races is at the start we had lots of messages in going this race did this and could you message them and now it's like telling me well I've gone to the race I've told them this isn't acceptable I've given them the guidelines and so races are getting this in feedback because we've put the guidelines out there saying this is what women deserve this is what equality is it's the, it's the equal opportunity it's the equal experience and and women aren't going to do races that don't have female fit t-shirts anymore is that feedback that you're getting actually yeah they're, they're, I think there's there's race directors that get the direct feedback that a woman has come to sign up the race and they haven't had the female fit option and also that they haven't had the no t-shirt option which is actually what a lot of runners want now we want not to have a t-shirt we don't want to have that impact in the environment if we own enough t-shirts um or we want to have something different that's a buff um or something that we're actually going to use kind of more in in real life um or the kind of the, the medals that you plant in your garden they grow into flowers kind of things like that things that are really making races stand out for being different and for being maybe more aligned um with our values so let's talk about the thing that was the trigger at least for for your journey in all this which is pregnancy what do you think is a reasonable pregnancy deferral policy for races like what what makes sense? what 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 have you advised london and berlin and chicago and all of those races to go with so um this depends on the race and this depends on kind of um there are races that women are happy to to run whilst pregnant and you may want to walk around your 5k um but you're certainly not going to be doing a a long distance ultra there's 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 two parts i think a lot of races races that you can sign up for and races you have ballot are different so ways you can just sign up for so you have the opportunity to race at a later date you're not going to lose that opportunity um we say can a two year deferral um or a lot of races just actually refund um as a simple thing to do administrative wise say have back and then we'd just love to see you on the start line some great races can kind of are looking to refund and then give a discount code to really try and actively get that one back to the start line and, and it's a small gesture but it it means so much and you know that kind of they'll probably bring their friends and their family and it's probably a really commercially great thing to do but it's also a lovely thing to do um so that's with the with the the, the free entry ballot is is different and ballot is about opportunity and for london it's so difficult to get into london marathon um and they've actually always had the the one year deferral um but this this way i think we have a three year deferral at london now um because If you just find out you're pregnant just before the race, um, and we're working with Ironman on this too, and we're speaking to them because they put a policy in place that was a one-year deferral, that's not good enough because if you've just found out you're pregnant before the race, then you have three months to get back on the start line. And I can say from experience that most people should not be racing at three months um, and have that stress on them. Kind of, and, and for me, I did it because I was going to lose my opportunity, and that was what was important to me. So not losing the opportunity, holding that place. Um, but that place has to be free, as in you don't have, shouldn't have to pay again. And, and New York came out with their policy and, and it was like, you know, kind of, this is our policy for kind of quality, inclusiveness, and, and it's socially responsible. And you have to pay again. I mean, that's not equal. That's not inclusive. And that's definitely not socially responsible to say, 
we'll just hold your place for you for, for a couple of years, but you're going to have to pay us again to enter the race. Um, and it's small. I think when we think about the quantum, kind of the whole of UTMB, um, who we've worked with, and they have phenomenal policy of a direct refund, but you have five years to have the opportunity to be on the start line you want to be on, um, which is exactly good for a race like that where you're generally traveling um, to the, the finals and it's a big thing for the whole family and it rolls if you have more babies um, is is just brilliant and and we'd love that but it was only 25 women taking it this year there are I don't know 10,000 um, runners so I think some of the pushback on you know kind of it's expensive etc is admin it's very few women but what it stops a lot of women doing is signing up for the race in the first place because you don't press a button and when you're pregnant, um, kind of when I had my kind of guaranteed UTMB place because I'd missed out twice in the ballot and I finally got it, I thought I'd have a one year old in the start line and pregnancy wasn't wasn't so easy. And, and I had a three month old. So it actually not having that policy kind of thinking not about the cost of of deferral, but actually not having that policy deters women from signing up in the first place. Um, and for, for us, it, not having that policy says something about the race and it says something about every other aspect of the race that they're refusing to do that for women what's the rest of the race going to look like um and that's really off-putting so it's the most obvious thing that can be done um if it's a, a refund that's great if it's a cheer deferral that's also great if it's a transfer a free transfer that's also kind of if it's within time that the woman can do a free transfer or deferral, something that doesn't financially penalize the woman for having a baby because that's just not acceptable. Yeah, I all of that makes total sense. And back to your point about, yeah, okay, you know, it's not commercial. I think it's perfectly commercial, commercially sensible to have a policy that is as generous as it can be with cases that, as you say, affects, you know, like half a percent of your women population, you know, like 0.25 of all of your runners. I mean, like, wh why split hairs there, to be honest, and come across as a jerk, to be honest? Like, it's just totally pointless to do that. And I would definitely, I think it's a great idea to say to women, you know, we're going to we're gonna defer your race or, you know, here's a refund. And as you say, just because women also struggle to get back to racing after uh, pregnancy, to just tell them, this is what I'm going to do. This is what we as a race are going to do for you we're going to give you an incentive through a discount or something to come back and do this race. And I'm sure they would, they would appreciate it massively. And honestly, like it's so dumb to just split hairs over this thing and like, Oh, and what? And like, you know, and like, you should have <laughs> thought of that before. I mean, yeah, you can, you can go down that way, obviously, because at the end of the day, I mean, it's your race, but you shouldn't. And I also totally see your point that, you know, you want to, for, for people, for women who want to enter these races that are kind of, you know, like you do once in a lifetime, London, so hard to get into, UTMB, all of those, all of those races, and you're also trying to have a family or have a second child or whatever, I mean, you're not going to time that to perfection. And you don't want that to hold you back from signing up. You want to have that insurance policy in the terms of the race that says, okay, if that happens, great, they're going to have me back in two years' time or whatever. Like it's you. I can definitely see how much comfort it would give women to have that in place. It's, and, and we choose that what we sign up to based on that. I have women ask me, say, I'm trying for a baby, but I want to do some races. You know, which ones have the policies? I'm going to sign up for them and, and give them my money. Um, and I think kind of at the, at the point I make on when people say I'm pregnant, I mean, women don't lie about being pregnant. And we've seen a race that asked for very detailed personal medical information um, and scans and everything. And um, that's just not necessary. So you can either have you were just told us you're pregnant and we would take that at face value. And that will be the right decision in kind of 99 percent of cases. Or you say we just want a signed doctor's note. Um, in the UK, you have to pay for that doctor's note in some cases if you don't have it. And then you're also getting into if you miscarry. So in the UK, you don't have a, a, an appointment with your doctor until about 13 weeks. And most miscarriages occur before then. And it's about 25% of pregnancies end in miscarriage. So putting that emphasis on a woman to go to a doctor to get a note when she's kind of pulled out of a race, but then she's miscarried and doesn't have any evidence. 
that's hard uh, and it's happened to me and it it's awful and I think kind of if race directors like you're pregnant we'll take that here's your deferral I, I think the race directors that don't ask are going to get um or it's a case of a medical note if you have one or you at this point in your pregnancy a medical note whatever you have um giving women the benefit of the doubt on this is is always going to be massively appreciated in in these circumstances yeah i can sort of also see what what you're saying there about when there is a way to game the system some people are going to try and game the system but on balance you need to have something practical simple that works for everyone and you know isn't very intrusive in the end so you know there's there's a balance to strike there now before getting pregnant even or actually um after getting pregnant i should say there's also the issue of childcare which <laughs> uh, i feel a little bit more invested in as a, as a father of two myself <laughs> I saw this while I was researching this episode. I saw this um, post on Medium by um, a trail runner called uh, Jesse McClurge that I think was involved also in, in some related um, activism and kind of like initiatives in the US. And she was suggesting, very radical, I thought, but makes perfect sense, that races should somehow, I mean, she wasn't really big on detail because it was more like a bullet point list, but she mentioned childcare there, right? So offering some kind of childcare support during races. And again, as I say, I think that's something that fathers could equally appreciate in some cases. Do you think that's A, reasonable, and B, it's something that would move the needle further for women participating in races, having that kind of like support? And and by the way, by childcare, I mean, I mean, okay, you can have a race, you know, like mind your children when you train or something, but, you know, for a marathon, for a longer race, does having some kind of option like that, like, is it even feasible? Does it make sense? Would it, would it make, would it make a difference for women? It's a great question. I think, I think it's a differentiator. I think we can't expect races to have childcare, but I think races that want to do more in certain areas um, and attract certain kinds of women and make it easier for us. Great. I mean, the ideal is that most kind of kids can get looked after by kind of their dads who kind of, I mean, it, it it's it doesn't feel like it's the same barrier for dads to get to the start line as women um and and i guess that's because we take most of the childcare um childcare duties but um where there are races so we've seen kind of 5k's short race to 10k races where there is a kids club on site which is great and it just really speaks to kind of and and there's family activities and um there's a playground or there's Kind of, and, and it's great for the vendors because, you know, they're going to sell more food. They're going to sell kind of more things. So that everyone's around longer. Um, there's a great race, um, a big bear race in the UK that um, did a, a six hour timed event around a forest school in the school holidays on like a Wednesday. So you had your kid for the day, but you put them into the forest school, which they're probably happier being in the forest school than with your day. And you run a six hour ultra marathon or a marathon or whatever you want to do in six hours or run a 10k and have a cup of tea um so there are there are things that it's it's we're always concerned about what's what's asking too much and kind of for race directors there's loads of ideas there's always ideas to go further and to signal that you really want women on the start line or you want families in the start line um and i think it's very similar about breastfeeding so breastfeeding the absolute minimum should be that if someone wants to breastfeed on the website it says that you know, if you would list breastfeed or you have any other um, needs to make your race more comfortable, contact us. Without that, women don't ask. Unless you ask us to ask, we don't ask. It's the, um, so many race researchers said, well, why didn't you ask? And it's like, women don't ask unless you let us know it's okay to do that. Um, so breastfeeding, like a private place to pump before and after or feed the baby. But, you know, And Mother, which is a great organization in the US, um, are really pushing kind of, the, the boundaries for women getting back after pregnancy and and having kind of marathons kind of breast milk transported around the course and pumps and it's phenomenal and it's absolutely if I was having another baby what I'd want to go and do it's not feasible for all races but we'd love to see it more races so those women have the option to have that brilliant experience and I guess we don't want to kind of ask for the world when actually for race directors that might seem oh, feel overwhelming where an 80 20 approach adopting the guidelines which are pretty much free gets us so much of the way towards that kind of more balanced participation that we want to see 
And by the way, the, the, the thing that keeps coming back here is that even if you can't do any of this, which you should be able to do quite a few of these, but even, even if some of these, you know, like feel out of reach, the, the thing you keep bringing back is communicating, right? I mean, even if you can't do anything about breastfeeding, put something in your FAQs or something, right? Put something on your website that says, that basically signals that, okay, we've thought about that. We, you know, we're unable at this moment to do anything about it, but just so you know, you know, unfortunately, we won't be able to have like a breastfeeding station or something or facilities or separate stuff, or we won't have like women specific changing facilities for this or that reason. Just communicate it. That that should go some way to making the race a little bit more transparent and, and friendlier for women, if they can at least see the information of what's going to be available on the website before they sign up, right? It's huge. I mean, we kind of in the insight kind of you know, 40% of women, it's a huge amount of women have not signed up for a race because they're uncertain of the logistics and they're uncertain of what's there, what's not there. Um, in the same way, kind of how you get to the start, making sure that they're going to feel safe. They're not going to be finishing a race in the middle of a field late at night with no safe way of getting home, really going through every aspect of questions that you might want to ask and putting them on the website, putting kind of all the things you're doing to make women's and everyone's race is a better experience on the website so that you know everything and then you'll click sign up. And and everyone's like, well, isn't this the same for men? And and I joke um, about my husband signing up for a cycle race. And it was a kind of a sun, sunrise to sunset or kind of um, race from one side of England to the other. Um, he had no idea how he was going to get to the start line. That wasn't on, there was nothing on the website. He had no idea how he was going to get home from the finish line with his bike, but he signed up anyway. A woman would not do this. And what surprise, we actually couldn't make it work without spending about a thousand pounds on everything in transport. And I was like, well, you're not doing it. Um, here's, here's a local sportive that starts at this time. You can drop the kids off at their sports thing first and you can do your hundred K and then I'll pick this up. And it, I was like, I need to, I, I need to know this before you sign up for races. Uh, so he's not allowed to sign up for anything unless I say yes now because we lose money. Um, but it's a huge thing and it helps everyone. And I think when you think about the questions, like ask people, what do you want to know? If it's quite hard stepping back from your own race, like team up with another race organizer and look at each other's websites and go, what would I want to know if I was a, a participant? Yeah, we always can say going to get a, a few trusted female runners that have done the race before to look at it again and say, this is great, but we don't tell people about this, or this is a bit difficult, or even the course itself, kind of, this is the profile of the course. These are where the aid stations are on a, on a graphic. This is where it's quite difficult. Um, this is a footwear that you want to need. Um, it's a dry race, run in your road shoes. If there's a heavy downpour, we'll let you know. It's all these small, small things that just take very, very little effort, but make a huge difference to not only people signing up, and this is men and women, but also then having that great race experience, knowing that there's a long distance between two checkpoints. You know, you may want to have bottles that carry quite a lot of extra water or these are exact snacks available for, for those who have different intolerances. It's all done in the race organizer plan. You just have to communicate it to us so we, we're more prepared for our race and then we can more focus on actually running rather than kind of everything else. One thing you mentioned um, there is uh, safety. There's also a pretty a fairly extensive passage in the guidelines about this. And I want to sort of like wrap up on this. I wanted to, because this is, I think this is going to get us into a, into a sad place. I just wanted to have it there at last of everything else. So it doesn't bring the mood down too badly, but it is a very concerning aspect of the circumstances that women find themselves in when racing. And that is the fact that, as in many other um, walks of life, there appears to be quite a non-negligible issue with harassment in racing. And when we discussed that offline, actually, I was I was really sad to hear from you that it's 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 far from being simply non-negligible. It's it's actually it's actually a big thing. So, what has been your experience with sexual harassment in races and other women's experience that you speak to about this? I mean, I don't know a single woman that hasn't had a negative experience racing. Not a single one. Um, and that's what we put out. It's it's everyone. Um, 
And for a lot of us, it's, it, it feels a bit of a part of life. Um, and whether that's physical, um, for example, if you're penned in very tightly with lots of other people and lots of other men, you may well get groped. That's quite typical for a woman. Um, so when there's bigger pens and there are some reserved women, if you want a women only pen, that's really appreciated. There are women that that's really triggering for to be so close to so many others and then pushed. So a lot of people being pushed off trails and then pushing past quite physically. I've been nearly knocked off my bike um, during a sportive by a man kind of wanting to go through a gap that didn't exist. Um, and I'm a lot smaller than, than another guy would be. I couldn't find, I was punched in a, in my first Ironman and my only Ironman because of this, I was punched by a guy in the swim and had half a tooth knocked out. Um, I had a pink cap on. He would have known I was a woman um, that punched me to try and then swam over me. It's endless. And I think so there's the physical ones. And then you have the, when you're running on trail, a man might let another man pass, but he's not going to let you pass as a woman. And these are a minority of men, such a minority, but we pass so many men in a race. And so you're going to have these encounters. Um, and then it's language. So it's from the kind of, um, oh, you're good for a girl or kind of um, kind of commenting our performance or kind of, oh, you're trying really hard. It's things that they wouldn't think they wouldn't say to men and, and volunteers the same thing from the kind of ones that are meant well to the ones that aren't meant well. So kind of we had someone say, you know, a volunteer say at the end, she didn't get the T-shirt that she'd ordered. And he's like, well, if you wanted the T-shirt, the fit, you should have run faster. And you've just finished this race and this is the comment. And it's language is so important and harassment is such a difficult thing to deal with and it shouldn't be there. And for race organizers, you cannot control what everyone's doing out on course. Um, at, but you can educate them to that A exists, um, that you're not going to tolerate it, and having penalties, um, time penalties for for if there is harassment, to call it out, so people call this out, um, and to stick up for women and and call, acknowledging the behaviour that men might think is okay. So you're running at night, tailing a woman at night is not okay. Um, when I've done mountain races, having a, someone on my shoulder that won't speak for, for ages and you turn around and they're there and they're so close and they're, they're using you as a pacer. But if they just say, can I pace, can you pace me up the mountain? Yes, but they don't speak or they run with you for a long period of time and you fake a toilet break to get rid of them. I faked a lot of toilet breaks. And so it's, it's all these small things, but I think race, and it can feel like too big an issue for race organizers, but having a very clear anti-harassment policy, briefing volunteers on acceptable language, especially the person on the tannoy at the end, uh, because they're often the worst at commenting on how people look and outfits and how the girls are done so well. Um, anyone that's making public announcements, really small, simple steps can change these things. And and the same thing kind of commenting on the, the women's race equally to the men's. The uh, volunteer thing is just totally inexcusable, to be honest. I, as you say, it's I guess I don't want to put it back to the the thing that people usually say about, you know, like, oh, it's people of a different generation or this or that. I mean, things, it has to be said culturally, have moved on so fast that some people struggle to to keep up. And 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 I would I would probably give the benefit of doubt, at least, particularly with with uh, British humor, which is so subtle sometimes, you know, <laughs> in terms of what people actually mean. But yeah, I mean, berating back of the pack runners, whether it's women, men or whatever, it's just totally, it's dispiriting for runners. And it's just, I mean, it sucks, right? To be on the receiving end of that, no one would want that. I think I think a good race sort of distinguishes itself with how it treats the back of the pack runners, not not like the, the elites and the fronts. Everyone can do that. But, you know, like like being courteous to everyone who who's still in the race is is really really important and common like that don't help on the announcers i hope these days people don't fall into traps like that like the announcer that i know of that i can think of wouldn't do something like that but i can also equally see why you know perhaps there might be some people out there who may you know make comments about appearance and and stuff like that on the other thing you mentioned about you know men just won't let a woman go past or tailing a woman, uh, stuff like that, which moves more towards race etiquette, I guess. 
what is, you know, other than telling people, I mean, I mean, how do you educate people, right? I mean, what kind of race director do I, is, is the bottom line of this podcast in situations like that? What can they say? You know, should they say that if a woman comes from behind and she's faster, just let her pass? Like, w- w- what should they do? What can they do, race directors, on this? I think you have a race policy that is like, this is what acceptable behavior is in our races, and we don't tolerate kind of harassment. I mean, it's it's kind of blocking anything that's, that's negative to your, your fellow competitors. And it's very simple, and it doesn't have to kind of be very even serious it's like we want everyone to have a great race this is just not acceptable and it makes people think twice and i think when other it's a race policy and someone else hears it then they'll be more supportive saying, sorry that you can't say that um that's not appropriate um getting kind of the male allies on this is important and i don't want to feel this is a huge part of she races but it's just a part that you know would make um i think especially the back of the pack runners kind of having them celebrated um, rather than you're so slow. Well, actually, kind of, we will say you, you're lapping everyone else that's sat on the couch um, and celebrating kind of achievements. There's the Dragon's Back race in the, in the UK, which is a phenomenally difficult stage race over the Welsh mountains. It's beautiful. I'm hoping to do it one day, but they give the biggest trophy to the person who spent the longest on the course. That's an, um, that is just every, says everything about the race that, you know, that person who spent the longest out there that has fought the hardest um, comrades in South Africa. Biggest celebration for the last person in and then the commiseration with the first, the first person is not because the cutoff is really tight. It's a wonderful thing to do. And I think that reflects on the whole race as to who's valued. Um, and and kind of at the other end, you know, making sure the female winner is equally valued to the male winner or the open winner, um, if that's the category. And the same coverage and the same kind of podiums, the same announcement, the same... Um, free race and saying it's two races and that woman is the same respect in the same way as that man that makes a lot of difference to the women that are further down the field to say my race is a, is a separate race and i'm i'm acknowledged for being an athlete for being me i think that the whole issue of race staff and volunteers sort of like you know getting out of line is totally on the race director and it's something that they can work on my sense is that probably the whole race etiquette thing, as you say, it has to be more kind of like bottom up. I think I think other men in the race have to take responsibility for that and for sort of, you know, like calling out fellow racers who do that kind of thing. I, it, it's, I, I don't think it's something that, I mean, obviously, you know, you can put something in a document or something as a race director, but I don't think if the um, objective is to actually change things. I think it's very difficult for a race or a single race director to do anything to affect that. I think it has to be the trail running community or the running community or whatever who takes responsibility for that. I, I think the thing is the race directors, if you call it out on the on the mic at the start, say, you know, we're having a great race, kind of respect everyone, kind of encourage every runner. This is what we do as a race. And then I think if there are issues, then they're dealt with um, and that you're confident that they'll be dealt with. And I think some things where kind of it's great and the races to have on each aid station, make sure there's a man and a woman. If you can do that, make sure there's, because if there are any female issues, you've got someone to go to. Also to ask for the period products if you haven't put them on the table, because um, a man wouldn't be like, what? Um, I think that's the gender balance and having people to go there and just taking it, uh, just being sensible. Um, we have a lot of work to do in the community. I hope it's getting better. I think there's definitely kind of, if men just stop to ask women about their running experiences and why we're worried to go out at night and why we're nervous in certain places, I think that there'd be a greater understanding because even my own husband kind of, I, I used to go to a gym in town and late at night and I used to call him on the way back and have my keys in one hand. And he said, why are you calling me? You're going to see me in 10 minutes. It's like, I need to know that if something happens to me, you're going to know about it. And he just doesn't understand as a man. Um, so the more conversations people can have, I think, the more we'll realise. And and this is magnified for kind of women who live in the middle of cities and, and, and women of colour as well. Um, we just have to be nice to each other. But I think a lot of races, having that fun atmosphere and having that inclusive atmosphere, that does that does nip a lot of it in the bud. I find great comfort in what you told me last time we spoke, that generally race directors that you speak to are more on the side of, oh, I didn't think of that. Well, thanks a lot for the suggestion, rather than, oh, you know, that's like 
total bullshit or whatever. And, you know, like, yeah, you know, that they're not dismissive. So I, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm really keen that that's sort of like the, the, the response you're getting. And I'm sure after this, uh, last hour and a half, we would have had tons of people with tons of questions. So how can they follow up on any of this? If a race, wants to do more on any of the aspects that we've discussed how can they do that through she races or get in touch with you so the guidelines are on the website she races.com and then we do have kind of an accreditation which is free because we don't think there should be barriers to taking down barriers um which is really just committing to the basics that any race could do um which is that the equal kind of equal respect for a race the, the inclusive imagery um the telling people stuff on your website um, and sufficient toilet. It's very, very simple. Um, and then we put your logo on our website and then you can use the She Races logo to signal that you are an inclusive race and you you want more women there. And that's been really effective for especially a lot of women looking for their first kind of stepping up races in the UK going, okay, this is a She Races race. And um, organisers use that with brands as well to say, you know, we follow the She Races guidelines. So um, it's all, be, we're Instagram at she.races where we share about what we're doing um, and a newsletter. And I'm at Ultra Sophie if um, they just want to see that 24-hour running. But I, I do a lot of like the, the work behind it on my own account, which is a, a bit of a bigger platform than, than she races so far. But yeah, no, we always answering questions, always getting things through. Race directors, like, I don't know what to do about this. Always happy to help. It's, uh, it's tough out there being a race director at the moment. And you know, if, if we can help you make your race better, then that's exactly what we'll do. We're not, I would say we're, we're kind of privately funded so far. So now we're out looking for brands to partner with so we can kind of expand the reach and we can kind of support more races and, and do more insight work because there's a gap in our insight between the women that want to be on the start line that aren't. So we've really got a handle on women that race, but we don't understand the women that, you know, aren't signing up for the races even one race in the first place. So that's hopefully some inside work we can get some funding to do. But um, yeah, reach out. Um, we're very friendly. <laughs> Absolutely. And having been on the site, I remember on the partners page, if I'm not mistaken, all the um, races I found there, some great names, were UK based, right? Do you do you guys do or take part? Obviously, anyone can go and download the guidelines as I did. And, you know, there's plenty for every race across the world to to learn from. But do you do you take on partner races from outside the UK or you leave that to more like US, US based organizations? I mean, the, the guidelines are universal. They're absolutely universal. And and they do go across. We have some event organizers that do triathlon and swimming um, and cycling races because they're all and we're looking to see is there anything else we could have for those races but very much kind of it's the, the barriers I think people say different groups have different barriers and we're like we all have the same barriers we, we feel them in different ways um so they're most UK because um I'm UK and and it was easy to get the message out there now I'm getting lots of international races being interested so I think it's 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 a funding issue because I need some help updating the website with all the new logos to add. Um, but there's loads and anyone can sign up. We'd love to have US races. We've got some Australian races coming on. We've got some Canny Cross, um, which is really exciting um, to learn about kind of barriers there and and support those events. But it'll be logos, but it's also the the, the it's signing the event contract, um, which is committing to very basic things. And they're putting the info up on the website, sending me the link to show that the info is on the website and then we send the Lego across. Um, and it's, it's just designed to be very, very simple, no cost, but just a way that races can show that they are doing things to women. And from the women's side, a place that we know that we're going to have a great experience and um, both kind of having this kind of signaling is, is great, but there are in the U S you've got trial sisters, which do, a bit of work on the races as well and they do a lot of work of engagement getting women to the start line so we absolutely love um what they're doing um the guidelines are quite deep across to the start line at the race and and the competition but any steps that races can take you know we we really appreciate it 
Yeah, absolutely. We should uh, give a shout out to um, Gina at uh, Trail Sisters and the rest of the crew. They're doing some some uh, great work, and I know you are collaborating. We, I hope we could have had Gina actually alongside you on the podcast just to give a bit of a U.S. perspective, but she was um, busy with other stuff. So, if you are based in the U.S., if you're into trail running, you want to do more around this kind of space, Trail Sisters is also um, a great website to check out. And I hope that uh, she races gets to have some funding, uh, which I'm sure, knowing you, you'll 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 get in no time to get uh, to get your research up and running, which would be great for the whole industry. Actually, what you're doing already is is fantastic. I was, as I said, lovely to see lots of races that I know from the UK being part of your uh, partner roster there. So I want to thank you very very much for your time today. It was really educational. Um, I hope for listeners, definitely for me. And I want to wish you all the best with She Races. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. That's great. Thanks for talking. It's it's it's, it's great to to have the opportunity to actually to address race organizers. I think that's the first time. And I've talked to a lot of podcasts talking to runners, but um, to to talk to race organizers directly and and try and put myself in their shoes is is a really helpful thing to have to do. So thanks everyone for listening. Well, thank you. We all really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone listening in. And then we'll see you guys on our next podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode on supporting female athletes with She Races founder, Sophie Power. You can find more resources on anything and everything related to race directing on our website, racedirectorshq.com. You can also share your thoughts about some of the things discussed in today's episode or anything else in our Facebook group, Race Directors Hub. Many thanks again to our awesome podcast sponsor, Run Sign Up, for sponsoring today's episode. And if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe on your favorite player. And do check out our podcast back catalog for more great content like this. Until our next episode, take care and keep putting on amazing races.